हाय डायरेक्टर सर सर गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग गुड इवनिंग आई एम ऑडिबल आर यू यस 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 गुड इवनिंग सर आ जस्ट वन मिनट Sir, shall we start? Just one minute. Just one minute. Yeah. Yes. We'll just share my one presentation also in case it is needed. Yes. Yes. Okay, right. I'm okay, ready. sir. Yes, uh, can we start? Yes, we can start. Yeah, sir. Yes, can we start? All right. Yes, sir. Am I audible? Yes, yes. All right. So, good evening, everyone. Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Sir Vijay. Thank you for taking time to join us today on Tech Series Two. This is Gaganyaan, the first human space flight of India, organized by UPES Dehradun in association with ISRO. Now I would like to request Dr. Sudhir Chaturvedi, Associate Professor, UPES, to take this session forward and welcome our esteemed speaker for the day. Thank you, sir. Over to you. Namaskar. Uh, we have come up with another interesting session on Mission Gaganyaan, the first human space flight of India, at UPES Tech Series 2022. So today we have the distinguished guest, Dr. R. Uma Maheshwaran. Dr. Uma Maheshwaran, born on May 20, 1963, completed his B.Tech in Electronics and Communication Engineering <coughs> from College of Engineering Trivandrum and Masters in Software Systems from Bits Pilani. He also holds a Master's degree in Russian Language from Kerala University. His interest, including launch vehicle technology, program management, science and technology related policies. He is the domain expert. in the field of launch vehicle system electrical integration check out ground station avionics systems engineering as well as in the space policy planning dr uma maheshwaran is with indian space research organization isro for over a period of nearly 35 years he has worked in vikram sarabhai space center vssc of isro for 31 years in various capacity including the project director of gslv from july 2014 to deputy director of vssc in avionics entity from may 2017 He was assigned to serve as the associate scientific secretary of ISRO at ISRO headquarters, Bangalore, from May to August 2018, and later elevated to scientific secretary ISRO. As a scientific secretary of ISRO at ISRO headquarters, Bangalore, and distinguished scientist of the ISRO, he was responsible for the overall policy, planning, and programs of ISRO. He was also leading the program office of technology development and innovation of ISRO headquarters. Dr. Uma Maheshwaran had char assumed charge as a director of Human Space Flight Center, Bangalore, on 3rd March 2022. He has played a vital role in drafting the sectoral reforms in space towards Atmanirbhar Bharat vision and also in drafting the Space Activities Bill. He was the chair of High Level Interim Committee in lieu of In Space Functions of ISRO Department of Space Government of India to implement the space sector reforms announced by the government. to enhance the participation of various private sectors in space activities 
In this capacity, he was instrumental in providing access to ISRO facility for testing the space systems from private industries for their space activities, for bringing in the national registration mechanism for Indian space objects, and also for launching the four student satellite in Polar Satellite Launch Vehicle PSLV. He has immensely contributed to ISRO's international cooperation by serving as the co-chair of joint working group with many space agencies uh, such as JAXA Japan, ESA Europe, NSSA Bahrain, CRTS, and many more. He has been a part of Indian delegation to many international astronautical congresses. He also signed the joint uh, declaration of interest for space climate observatory at Paris in June 2019 on behalf of ISRO. Dr. Uma Meshwaran represented the UNOSCO COPUS uh, meeting in June 2019 and led the ISRO delegation in APRSAF 2020. He has been el elected as a chair of working group on long-term sustainability of space activities in UNOSCOPUS scientific and technical subcommittee as a subcommittees. During his tenure in Vikram Sarabhai Space Center, he was actively involved in the system integration, checkout and avionics of ISRO <coughs> launch vehicles with PSLV, GSLV, GSLV, MK3. He has been the chief designer, integration of major sub-assemblies, including the equipment bay of ISRO's launching uh, operational launch vehicles. One of his significant contribution was the design of a mission critical circuits residing in the launch vehicle, including the entity PIDO chains. He has successfully accomplished three successive uh, GSLB missions as its mission director. He was also the vehicle director for the remarkably successful GSLB D5 GSAT 14 mission with the indigenous cryo stake. He led the operational launch vehicle team of avionics production hardware production, structural analysis, and control guidance to enable the successfully deliver, deliver the products for the increase in the frequency of PSLV, GSLV, and MK3 missions. As a deputy director of avionics entity, VSSE, he was entrusted with the task of leading a young team of engineers for developing the end of miniaturized avionics. He also superheaded the induction of electromechanical actuation system in launch vehicle control systems. He is also currently the member of the Board of Trustee of International Academy of Astronautics and member of In Space On Board. Dr. Uma Maheswaran is the member of several international and national bodies of engineering and science, including the member of Section 2 of Engineering Science of IAA and member of the Committee on Space Traffic Management of IAA, Fellow of Aeronautical Society of India, Astronautical Society of India, Life Member of Society System of System Society of India, and Indian Society of Advancement of Materials and Process Engineering. He is the president of ISSC Bangalore chapter. Dr. Uma Maheswaran is a chair of a program committee and advisory committee PRAC in the Center of Nanotechnology and Engineering IASC and co-chair of a joint policy committee of ISRO IIT Bombay Space Technology Cell. Dr. Uma Maheswaran has won several awards including ISRO Individual Merit Awards 2013, ISRO Team Awards 2006, ISRO Team Awards 2014 and ISRO Outstanding Achievement Award 2018. He also received the ASI ISRO Award for the year 2016. He is the recipient of Honoris Kaza uh, from the Satyabhama Institute of Science and Technology, Chennai. He has received Dr. Biren Roy Space Science and Design Award from the Aeronautical Society of India in 2019. Welcome, sir. Welcome on board to UPES again, once again. Uh, so I uh, hand over to you. Uh, our Vice Chancellor sir, will join in a very short and then in between we can uh, introduce you. Thank you so much for accepting our, uh, our request, sir. Over to you now. Thank you so much. Let me apologize for a very long introduction. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, first of all, uh, let me thank you and uh, the University of Petroleum and Energy Studies, Dadadun, for uh, giving me the opportunity, this opportunity to share uh, some of my thought process related to the very prestigious Gaganyan program uh, with the uh, students of uh, this university. So I think this is the second time that I'm with you. Uh, I had yes, yes, yes. Once earlier, when I was scientific secretary. So uh, thank you very much for uh, giving, uh, inviting me again. Uh, Thanks, sir. It's all. Should we wait for Vice Chancellor to come? Or uh, uh, no, sir. I, I think you can start. Uh, VC sir will join in in a while. In a while. Okay. So let me share my presentation with you. Uh, sure. I made a very short presentation on Gaganyan so that uh, 
try try to cover the wide spectrum of uh, what is involved in the Gaganayam project in a, in a kind of uh, few slides so that uh, the fundamentals or the, 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 you will be able to get a hang of what is going on here. So let me share that uh, slide with you, slides with you. Is it uh, visible to you? Yes, yes. <clears throat> it's visible, sir. Ah, uh, okay. So, uh, uh, basically, as you know, uh, the formerly the Gaganayal program was announced by Honorable Prime Minister of India on the 72nd uh, Independence Day, 2018, uh, wherein uh, he very clearly announced that uh, the program is to develop a human habitable space capsule to carry uh, a maximum of the three crew members to a 400 kilometer orbit. So saying a beta or beti of uh, India will fly from our own soil in our own uh, in our own Atmanirbhar indigenous uh, launch vehicle uh, in our own space capsule to the orbit and uh, come back safely uh, after maybe three days to seven days. Uh, so this was the announcement made by the Prime Minister and uh, he gave a very, uh, I would say, very ambitious target, very tough target of uh, uh, completing it in four years before the this uh, this August we are supposed to complete it and, uh, and make the mission possible uh, and all efforts were on, it was a very ambitious target. But unfortunately, as all of you know, in between, uh, almost we lost two years because of the uh, unprecedented COVID scenario in India, wherein, uh, you know, the entire ISRO program is uh, spread across all over India, industries, academia, the other institutions, the other labs. And, you know, uh, during COVID period, even transportation movement itself was not possible. So definitely it had uh, its own impacts. Industries were almost closed for so many, uh, I would say, months and the supply chain was cut and all such issues were there. So there was uh, definitely it has affected us, but we are back on track now and uh, very soon we'll have the all the kind of uh, pre-qualification and uh, demonstration test will be over in, a, in maybe in one year time frame so that we'll be ready for the first mission soon. So. So when we are talking about this uh, program, it is not as if we started everything uh, once the Prime Minister announced. It's not so. The, the planning had started, I would say, as early or as, as early as 2003 to 2004 time frame, when the study team was initially constituted to see, to, to converge to the overall configuration, the feasibility, what kind of technology need to be used, etc. And the study team worked for two years and they supplied and, and they submitted their report based on the analysis and uh, the, the findings or recommendations of the subcommittee or the study team. Uh, later in 2008, another study team was made to build on the recommendations of the first study team to have a comprehensive configuration and plan and the strategies to be evolved. That subcommittee also worked hard to address the various scenarios, the current uh, uh, global scenario, etc. And they also uh, formed up a kind of a report wherein it was very clearly spelled out as to what way we should proceed. And based on that, in 2012, I think uh, a pre-study project was formed. And their basic idea was to develop as a project mode develop the essential work uh, packages that are needed and, uh, the, and ensure that the technologies are developed for uh, making the mission possible. And uh, they did a commendable work and uh, based on the developmental activities that they carried out, the, the demonstrative tests that they carried out and the technological uh, realization that they did, uh, then only uh, based on that only we could convince the government that now we are almost ready to take up the mission and with that only the Honorable Prime Minister uh, announced 
the gaganyan program so with this uh, you know the uh, if you talk about gaganyan basically the the whole uh, uh, mission looks like this wherein i mean i say the, the whole mission the whole uh, vehicle looks like this wherein we have the our uh, the most powerful launch vehicle that we have that is the geostationary satellite launch vehicle gsl mark 3 we call the most powerful rocket that we have it is capable of taking 4 ton uh, mass of uh, satellite to a geo geostationary orbit you know geostationary orbit is uh, basically for communication purposes wherein the orbit is at 36500 kilometers so we are using the same gsl uh, mark 3 vehicle which we call uh, with some modification the sense we need to make it human rated because this is a totally different ball game when instead of the satellite uh, the the payload is uh, human beings so the reliability has to be uh, the uh, at most uh, the uh, the quality and reliability takes paramount here the design has to be as robust as well as we need sufficient margins to so see that and 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 in other situations are handled properly so to that extent uh, the launch vehicle has been uh, rated for carrying the humans and uh, the human rated dsle matri will be is able to will be will be able to take the crew module we what when we say crew module it is the uh, the module in which the human beings are sitting or they are they, they, that is a place where they sit and uh, Uh, the whole mass of that crew module is around uh, put together it's around 8 ton so the sli matri is fully capable of taking a, a turn to an orbit of 400 kilometers so this is the launch vehicle that we have and uh, the crew the orbital module as we can see there is, is indicated there it contains a crew module and a service module i'll come to that later and along with that one of the most important technologies that we need to successfully acquire and we need to successfully demonstrate this crew escape system which is uh, almost paramount because during the orbital phase if any uh, untoward incidents happen the crew has to be saved so for that the escape system has to be is very essential and that also design is complete so that's how the it is the topmost part you can see crew escape system and uh, the the whole program is seen that uh, now we are planning for a three day uh, uh, three crew or a two crew mission and uh, at a 400 kilometers orbit and uh, once the mission is over it will come back and uh, the crew module will come back and land in the sea in the sea that's the idea so again coming to the uh, orbital module in specific you can see that this is the way it is configured where you have the crew module where the, the astronauts or the gaganauts or whatever you call they are sitting inside and we have the service module which enables the crew module to navigate to, to during its orbital phase so the service module will be separated at the time of re entry of the crew module when it is coming back uh, during its descent trajectory and as i said earlier the crew escape system on the right hand side you can see it contains a very sophisticated uh, set of uh, solid motors which will take uh, the crew module away in case of any inadvertent scenario at a much accelerated pace so that uh, the crew is made safe or they escape from the uh, impending disaster as we can call it so what are all the prerequisites you need a human rated propulsion system uh you need the crew escape system as i said earlier and the vehicle configuration because it's slightly different from gsl mark 3 because instead of the satellite area and the heat shield or the payload fairing what we call we have the crew module and on top of that we have the crew escape system so again the overall aerodynamic configuration changes so we need to prove that and the launch pad from which this vehicle is launched needs additional safety features again concentrating on the requirement of taking the crew safely away and another very important thing very new technology that we need to develop is a integrated vehicle health management system again which is uh, focused on how to save the crew in case of any inadvertent scenario so we need very highly accurate measurements and algorithms which is which will enable us 
to detect a priori an impending uh, problem or impending uh, uh, issue. And uh, it can be at the launch pad itself, or it can be during the ascent phase, or it can be during the orbit. And we need to predict the, the problem and uh, take an appropriate decision where to make the crew escape or not. So this is a very important, very complicated system which we are developing. Then, as I said, uh, Camera both is off. Off, yes, yes. Everything is off. Can you switch on, please, again? He left, basically. No? Can you rejoin, please? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, it has come. It has yeah, come. Are they audible to you? Yes, now? yes, yes. Yes, okay. sir. Okay, can you go back to the person? Where did where did uh, you, you lost me? Uh, that aerodynamics. We're telling about aerodynamics. I think okay. fourth slide. I'll go back to that. Okay. What I was telling, am I audible now? Yes, yes. Okay, so what I was trying to tell is the as far as DSLE Mark III is concerned, there is a slight difference uh, with respect to uh, the overall configuration because the normal launch vehicle we have the payload pairing within which the satellite is put. Instead of that, we have the crew module with a different shape, and we have the crew escape system sitting on top of it like a uh, like a, an antenna. So uh, the aerodynamic configuration needs to be validated. And uh, since uh, there are modifications required in the launch pad with more safety features, again, focusing on the uh, safety requirements of the astronauts or the gaganauts or, uh, who are sitting there. And in case any problem comes in the launch pad, they should uh, uh, rush out and escape. So that the escape uh, measures are to be fitted into the launch pad. And I say, say another important thing is the integrated vehicle health management system, which is again focusing on the uh, safety of the crew. We need to have uh, high accurate and reliable instrumentation and algorithms which will predict an impending disaster or a problem so that uh, a priori before the disaster happens itself, we will detect and uh, uh, the crew escape system will be initiated so that the crew is taken away safely before the uh, disaster happens. So this is a very complicated system which we have developed now. And as far as reliability is concerned, in the normal launch vehicles and the normal missions, we have dual redundant. The two chains are there active, while now we are going for four chains, uh, which are uh, simultaneously active. And uh, for the function to happen, only one chain is sufficient. And uh, again, with respect to uh, the enhanced safety margin, as I was telling earlier, the structure, the, 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 the propellant tanks, the Pressures, pressurization systems, everything should have higher margins, higher safety margins, so that the reliability of the overall system improves. So that also we have achieved. Now coming to uh, regarding the uh, crew habitat or the area where the crew is residing or they are sitting, this uh, entire technology is absolutely new, and we have decided that we will go independently. We will design from our own. 
uh, expertise and uh, because uh, we need to have Atmanar Bharata here because no country will be ready to give everything what we want as far as these technologies are concerned. So instead of waiting for them to give, we decided we'll go on our own. So that uh, uh, this is a very complicated system, absolutely new to us because we need a personalized uh, uh, crew module structure. The structural design itself was a challenge. And uh, most importantly, the environmental control and life support system. We call it ECLSS, which is all the more critical for the crew. Without this, the crew will not be able to survive. Uh, I'll come to that where we need to have the, past, the pressure of oxygen. Oxygen needs to be supplied. It needs to be maintained. The pressure has to be maintained. The carbon dioxide has to be removed. The humidity from the body of the astronauts that has to be removed. Uh, the temperature has to be maintained at the same time in a comfortable level. So a, ho a whole lot of uh, so human-centric human requirements are there, which are absolutely new, but we are developing that. Then the crew seat, where the crew is they are accommodated and its impact because the, it should protect the crew from any any load that is coming on them because their body, their spine, our body is very flimsy. So that should not get the... Uh, uh, ...the outside world, uh, the, the outside space. And that's a very tricky decision, design because we need a transparent... Uh, uh, scenario where the things are visible at the same time, it should not start leaking and create problems. The joint, the interfaces are extremely cru crucial and uh, highly involved. Then we need to have the parachute systems to when the when the crew module is coming back and re-entering uh, back to atmosphere. The parachutes have to, because it comes at a very high velocity, and the parachute system has to decelerate the crew module in such a way that at an acceptable velocity, the crew the crew module splashes into the sea. Uh, so that is a very, very uh, uh, complex system. A system of parachutes are uh, required. So that design and implementation is going on. The avionic packages, of course, I have talked about it. Another very critical thing, which may not be very crucial for the first few missions, is the impact of micrometeoroid and orbital debris. You know, the debris problem that is happening in space is uh, becoming complex every other day. And we need to protect our uh, module, the, the, the crew, crew module, from the impact of these uh, materials and uh, debris. We have a space situational awareness program. We have uh, our own uh, methodology, our own instrumentation to detect uh, the meteoroids or the small particles or the debris, what you call. And we have our own soft analysis uh, tools for that. Am I still audible? Am I audible to you? Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. okay. Then, as I said, the human sending products, I will come to that. And uh, also the display. We need to have uh, uh, the remote, con in, in case we, uh, the, the crew has to intervene uh, in any, any emergency situation that needs to be addressed so that the appropriate consoles and appropriate display, which they understand should be put. Uh, so such uh, requirements are there. So uh, coming to the environmental control system, as I said earlier, basically contains the air revitalization system where the, we have to remove the carbon dioxide, we have to remove the order, we have to remove the trace gases. The pressure, cabin pressure has to be maintained. The breathing oxygen has to be maintained. At the same time, the pressure, partial pressure of oxygen has to be maintained in that particular ratio. Thermal and humidity control system has to be there where the humidity has to be removed. And we, for all these things, we need a closed loop guidance control system. So this is a very complex system, and the, the most of the uh, the I would say the most of the power or the uh, the energy is derived from the service module, wherein we have the pumps, the common setters, valves, the gas bottle, the radiators, etc. Place. So they they will serve the requirement of the uh, cabin, the crew module, uh, maintaining all the other four uh, systems that I. I told earlier, until uh, the uh, the crew module starts its descent. And uh, during the descent portion, whatever is needed to maintain the cabin system is within the crew module itself. So that way we have designed. And the overall mission profile, if you talk about, as I said earlier, it will we'll be launching from our spaceport, Sriharikota, wherein uh, the 
the first stage first stage like 110 ton liquid stage so they will uh, start uh, accelerating the first phase after which the first stage uh, will get separated and after the first stage separation the the crew escape so everything is normal means beyond that the crew escape system uh, we will not be required so we will separate the crew escape system and the second stage will propel it uh, to a particular altitude beyond which the second stage also will separate and the third stage the cryo stage will take over with the crew module and will go to the orbit and in orbit the service module will uh, maintain the crew uh, module in its uh, uh, in its uh, orbit in the particular act the attitude maintenance will be done and it will be it will be going around uh, the earth at 400 km circular orbit and after the prescribed time is over the debus will start and the and the or module will be the orbital module will get reoriented itself then the uh, and the service module will first separate and then the crew module will start entering the atmosphere and then the aero braking the parachute the uh, the drop chute the uh, the main chute etc one by one will start getting deployed and the deceleration will start so that finally uh, the crew module will splash down in the sea at an acceptable velocity like maybe 8 meters per second so this is the kind of uh, profile that we have and uh, as i said earlier for a complete success of this mission we need to establish the functioning the reliability of the entire mission at the same time we have to demonstrate that our design is capable of safeing or taking the uh, uh, maintaining the safety of the uh, crew at any point of time during the mission so taking into that we have to demonstrate a series of tests prior to the you know the first uh, um uh, human mission and uh, we are almost on the threshold of having the first few tests this month or in a couple of months uh, we have a series of integrated air drop tests what we call iadt where the crew module itself will be taken in a chinook helicopter and taken to around 5 kilometers to 6 kilometers and they will be dropped so this is to demonstrate the reentry part of the crew module where in the parachute mechanism we need to Uh, we need to establish and uh, and ensure that without they work without any blemish so it's a very complex system so we we are planning around 16 to 17 numbers of this air drop test uh, uh, mm -hmm. for uh, establishing the reliability as well as the functioning of the entire system similarly we are having a test vehicle missions where we have developed a new launch vehicle where on top of which the crew module and the escape systems are put basically the objective of the test vehicle mission is to see that the escape mechanism is working without any problem so at the same time it mission as i said earlier it could be at the launch pad itself or during the initial ascent phase or at the later ascent phase and we should demonstrate all these failure modes so we are planning a series of test uh, maybe a four or five test vehicle missions Uh, along with the pad about test pad about test is nothing but uh, the uh, same uh, uh, issue wherein uh, something is happening at the launch pad itself so that the the escape system takes the crew module in, in from the launch pad and takes takes it to an altitude of uh, 5 km or 6 km and then drops it comes back with the parachute it deploys and it flashes in the say 2 km or 3 km away from the launch pad so the a series of these tests are planned the first uh, test vehicle mission we are uh, mostly we will be uh, conducting uh, by november end or december beginning this year itself and once the series of integrated air drop tests the test vehicle missions and the pad about tests are successfully demonstrated and completed then we will go for the first unmanned flight where in the entire uh, flight sequence everything will be same like the uh, this like the manned flight but without the man in uh, position so this will be a demonstrative flight at least two flights we are planning now uh, based on the subsequent uh, the way things go or the results that we get maybe one more flight we plan that we are able to decide but definitely two unmanned flights will be there and uh, you might have heard that we are putting a half humanoid into into the crew module we call it biomitra and the idea is to see that we will be instrumenting the half humanoid to see that 
what kind of environment uh, is really felt uh, and also make some trials by which uh, the humanoid will attempt to communicate and, and uh, to the ground and also will try to access certain uh, certain uh, act or try to do certain very minimal activities so once this is completed man unmanned flights are successfully completed we will go on the first manned flight and the unmanned the first unmanned flight is uh, now tentatively scheduled by end of next year now as i said the crew escape i have already described the mechanisms with respect to the crew escape uh, it can be at uh, launch pad or it can be during uh, the first up to the first stage separation or then uh, once it goes to the orbit then the deorbiting uh, depending on this failure scenario and it will come to see uh, uh, and uh, also uh, in orbit it will come back again so these different modes uh, in the sense at different points we are trying to define a failure mode and activate the uh, recovery or uh, safety of the crew module and uh, uh, making it to, to ensure that it lands safely and we are able to recover the crew without any problems uh, similarly the integrated air, air drop test i have already described where we need to establish the parachute mechanism we have the first the cover we call it apex cover the first that has to be removed for that we have the apex cover separation parachutes they have to operate first once apex cover is removed then the the uh, the uh, drop chutes will uh, get developed uh, the, the they they will deploy and once the, the drop chutes are deployed then the three pilot chutes will get deployed once the pilot chutes gets deployed then only the fully uh, main chutes will get deployed so it is a clustered uh, deployment and uh, uh, the uh, it will be in steps what we call disreefing technology so these are all new technologies which we are we want to demonstrate thoroughly and see that there are no issues uh, before we attempt the first uh, manned mission and the test vehicle again i told you it's a new design what we have done a new vehicle itself was configured and we are planning some three four test vehicle missions where the failure modes will be simulated at various altitudes initially we will go up to 11 kilometers in another mission we will go up to 7 kilometers but with a different configuration so different failure modes we are trying to simulate and see that the crew module is taken away by the crew escape system and they come back safely the parachute deployment will be will be uh, will be demonstrated you also kindly note that it is not only uh, the coming back safely we need to uh, recover the crew safely for that it's a huge operation and the indian navy is the lead for that and we need a series of a set of uh, helicopters a set of uh, 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 ships as well as uh, some dinghies etc which which has to approach the crew module and uh, take the uh, astronauts away so it's a it's a complicated process and during all these trials what i have described till now these these also will be carried out so that this will be a dress rehearsal for the entire crew as you know uh, 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 again coming to the pad about i already explained enough on pad about test no yeah, uh, you you must also understand that this whole uh, gagatian program as such is not an isro program isro is only a kind of uh, let's say a catalyst or a trigger for the entire program it's a pan india program i think all the stakeholders are a few, quite a number of stakeholders we have as i said we have the industries you know most of the uh, missions of isro uh, are done by industries only more than 70 to 75% of the activities are being done in industries only so they are actually our partners in this mission we have the uh, the three uh, armed forces uh, navy the air force as well as the army to who are participating in this in fact uh, the astronauts we have selected is from indian air force test pilots only so we feel for the first mission they are the best suited and they are the best exposed persons in such in, in these kinds of environments and also the various uh, labs including the various labs at drdo we have bark 
with us. Uh, we have the IMD, the CSAR, and as a host of uh, young scientists from and young uh, aspirants from the academia. So it's a it's a totally a pan India program as I have shown here. Uh, various labs are doing various requirements with respect to the, the the kind of spectrum of activities that is involved in this huge program of Jagannath. And when you talk about the, uh, the Pan India program, it is not limited to a Pan India program. We have international, very strong international collaborations. We have very strong relationship with the Glav Cosmos of Russia, who, and as I said earlier, the initial phase of the astronaut training was carried out in Russia. Our astronauts went there and they had a training for almost one year. Now they are back in Bangalore. We have our astronaut training center here where they are the Indian and the Gaganian specific training they are undergoing now. We have a very good uh, uh, collaboration with the Australian Space Agency as far as the tracking requirements are concerned. And uh, with respect to tracking as well as communication, we have a collaboration with the ESA, the European Space Agency. We have a very good uh, relationship with NASA and technology uh, requirements. And uh, it basically with respect to communication and other uh, visibility requirement, uh, for during the uh, Gaganian mission, ongoing mission. Then we have a tie up with CNES France, wherein we have an implementing arrangement for the flight surgeon, training of the flight surgeons and the ground support. It's very extremely important to keep the astronauts uh, in good health. And uh, similarly, we have some technological tie ups with Canada also and Romania. So it's a, internationally, we are well connected. As I said earlier, the crew recovery is a very complex operation wherein uh, after touchdown, uh, we need to approach the crew module and uh, rescue the or take the crew out as well as uh, then recover the crew module also subsequently. So it's a, we have an interagency committee wherein all the stakeholders, as I told earlier, they are all involved as CRO. We are uh, regularly meeting, discussing the various options. And the, during all the uh, demonstrated trials that I explained to you earlier, all these uh, stakeholders will be in action so that it will be a dress rehearsal for them for the actual actual event. And talking about crew selection also, we entered into a very elaborate process wherein uh, basically uh, uh, in, uh, aviation medicine of Indian Air Force, they were Institute of Aviation Medicine, they took the lead. So they examined the Air Force pilots, test pilots specifically. 60 candidates were first screened by the IAM and they selected around 26 candidates. And based on that, we, we, we consulted with our Russian experts and based on the dossiers, they, uh, it was, uh, they screened out and selected another 19 candidates and the medical examination of those candidates were done again in Russia. And after that, five candidates were selected. And after the, once again, uh, detailed valuation, we have uh, finally concluded on four and they are undergoing training now. And uh, as I said earlier, the, uh, the picture shows our astronaut training facility in Bangalore and uh, the mission specific training uh, with respect to Gaganian is uh, being, uh, they are undergoing now. So these are all some of the specifics uh, with respect to the training. Uh, this is going in full swing now which includes, uh, you need uh, quite a lot of simulators because it is not only the software simulation and, uh, and uh, making the astronauts get a feel of how the mission will be. We need uh, uh, virtual reality training because they not only the uh, mission part, they have to sit and they have to get a feel of the uh, crew module. They have to see the, uh, how best they can access and what are the kind of freedom that they are having with respect to movement requirements. And where are the essential controls located and how to access them? All these things they need to continuously get trained so that without any thinking process, if any requirement is there, they'll be able to do that. So we have virtual reality training simulators and we have static mockups wherein the actual crew model will be there and they'll be sitting inside that and trying to understand. And therein itself will simulate the vehicle motion or the uh, simulated the mission profile so that they'll be able to react at various uh, critical situations and uh, like that a series of simulators have to be made, uh, uh, we are making and let me also tell you that they're they all fully indigenous 
everything is made in india as far as this limited are concerned so during the course of time as i said you know even though we were troubled with the covid we have actually we have quite a lot of milestones we have achieved like you know the as far as a launch vehicle is concerned i would say that we are practically completed everything in the launch vehicle i must say is ready now the cryo stage a series of tests have gone more than 125 on 130 tests have been completed a few more another 20 to 30 tests are also pending it to be completed in a couple of months so we have not seen any anomaly it is a 100% success uh, series of tests similarly second stage i told you L, the liquid stage l110 110 ton liquid stage all the required uh, qualification tests have been successfully completed and most importantly the s s200 the static test of the solid booster i told you there are two solid boosters as you can see in the picture uh, they have been slightly modified with respect to the requirement of uh, human rating and that static test also has been successfully completed so that uh, there are no technology issues pending and another important series of tests that you have completed is absolutely new because it is regarding the crew escape system i told you five sets of different solid motors are designed these are all very high energy uh, high burn rate solid motor, motor boosters which will operate for a very short time and success we have completed one series of uh, or the qualification test successfully uh, which uh, which gives a lot of confidence for us as far as the crew escape system functioning is concerned and also the, as i told you we made a special launch vehicle for test vehicle where in this particular launch vehicle is already ready and it is in seri kota on to which we will be uh, putting the crew module and our first test vehicle mission as i said earlier is planned uh, somewhere around the uh, end of november or beginning of december so it's very exciting times ahead for us uh, and uh, all of us are all all the entire india i must say is working earnestly for uh, seeing that this mission is getting accomplished at the earliest so with this uh, let me conclude i just wanted to give you an overall feel of the different facets of what is this gaganyan that we are talking about so uh, now i over to you for further discussions if any thank you very much thank you sir uh, for your kind uh, presentation now we are open to the question uh, students can um, you know give the queries in the chat box please and sarvesh ji please take it forward sure sir thank you so sir we have one question like uh, ayush has asked how can i enter into isro after graduation yeah uh, let me tell you there are basically there are three uh, three parts uh, or three uh, paths for uh, getting into isro one is uh, since you are specifically tasking asking with respect to after graduation then uh, one path is already closed that path is basically after co completing your plus 2 we have our own indian institute of space technology uh, iast which is located in trivandrum in kerala we take uh, students uh, after completing their plus 2 presently the eligibility criteria is uh, pass in iit je advanced and based on your rankings you are going you will be selected and then you will be studying for four years for uh, three basically three uh, areas one is aerospace engineering uh, second is uh, uh, electronics and communication and third is space physics or space science that's it so for each i think Put to put together regularly every year around 130 to 140 seats will be there, and if you are qualifying and based on your ranking in IIT JEE advanced, you will be selected, and then once you complete the course successfully, within brackets to certain constraints or basic requirements, then you are getting an opportunity directly to enter this role. Of course, subject to certain conditions. so that is one path second path is as we asked after graduation uh, one by week we conduct one exam called uh, icrp integrated recruitment board we have a recruitment board in isro and every year it will be conducting uh, written exams 
uh, across India, and you just watch for our website where the advertisement will come, and you can write the exam. And if you qualify, there will be an interview, and then based on the interview, you will be selected into this role. If you complete your graduation in engineering, that is the second part. Third part is we ourselves will come to uh, uh, premier institutions like uh, not only earlier we used to go to only IITs, now we have expanded. We are we are very particular that we should go to uh, other colleges also like NITs and also some uh, reputed local colleges in specific areas. So like that, uh, we, we, we go there, we interview the people and uh, based on that interview, we select uh, people who complete their graduation. There is a fourth part for uh, post-graduation and uh, research students. We have an open uh, uh, mechanism wherein the website, we have a, a, a page wherein the post-graduation, or I mean, basically we are looking at uh, PhD, can, PhD students, doctorate students. They can post their uh, specific uh, or their uh, uh, resume there. And depending on uh, the, each center's requirement, if he satisfies, the, first of all, the requirement we should, should be there. And if he is satisfying the criteria, he'll be called for an interview. And if he succeeds in the interview, he'll be selected. So this is another method for after post-graduation. So these are all some of the methodologies by which you can enter a So we have one more question. Yeah. Uh, the is from Mark Gupta is asking, what is the decision to govern? But, sorry, I didn't get it. So what is the distance between the earth to Gaganyan? 400 kilometers. Gaganyan is nothing but the launch vehicle or the or the orbit or the orbital module. It will go to a maximum of around 400 kilometers circular orbit in the space. So Jeet is asking what will be the mission requirements for Gaganyan? Yeah, that is what, uh, that's a very elaborate question. That is what I was trying to explain uh, last 15 minutes. The mission requirements, as I said, the first and foremost is to take the uh, crew uh, into a 400 kilometer orbit, circular orbit, maximum they can stay up to two to three days and they have to come back safely and land in sea near either in Arabian Sea or the Bay of Bengal, depending on the scenario, and they will be recovered. So that is the first and foremost requirement. And uh, of course, in subsequent missions, uh, initially they may not do much of the activities, but in subsequent missions, some more experiments and activities will be included so that uh, the astronauts will be busy during the, the mission, so during the time they spend in orbit. That is as far as the uh, main objective is concerned. Of course, the other uh, secondary objectives like ensuring that we achieve the technologies we achieve the reliability, we achieve the quality standards or maintain and sustain the quality standards. All are the uh, or the uh, associated uh, technological requirements that we need to establish and sustain also. That is always there. Yeah. So Nakshi is asking, is there any scope for astrophotography in India? Uh, I definitely, because I don't know whether you are aware, our first, uh, uh, the only uh, space observatory that we have spent is called AstroSat. I don't know how many of you have heard about that. It is a very successful mission. The last four years, AstroSat is giving wonderful pictures, wonderful photographs, and some of the, uh, I would say, uh, path-breaking discoveries on uh, stars and some other things have been uh, found out using our AstroSat. So it's already there in the sky. So Aditya is asking uh, which rocket engines are used in the first and the second stage of the mission. Yeah, the first stage, as I told you, the initial uh, thrust will be given by our two solid motors, 200 ton solid motors. We call it S200. It's a solid propellant. And uh, this, then, then immediately after that, we have the second uh, stage L110, that is a liquid in liquid propulsion engine. Basically we use, uh, as you know, uh, the uh, unsymmetrical demethyl hydrazine. Hydrazine is the fuel. So to 110 tons of the propellant will be used. And then the third stage of the vehicle is basically cryo stage. That is liquid oxygen and uh, liquid uh, 
hydrogen, liquid hydrogen as the fuel. It's a 25 ton thrust uh, engine, basically. So these are all the different kind of uh, propulsion that we use for the mission. So one uh, very interesting question we have, Dr. Saswati Datta. Can we have ISRO UPES joint research program at UPES? Where? Sorry. ISRO and UPES, UPES where? Yeah. Where? Yeah. Something you added. What is A that? joint research program at UPES, sir. There are what is UPES? Uh, so University of Petroleum and Energy Studies, our institute. Okay. Our okay. okay, 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 fine. Uh, basically, uh, we have already a, 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 an exhaustive program wherein uh, uh, we can develop uh, uh, um, the technology together. See, we have uh, two, three modes of operation. We have something called a respond program. Every year, uh, we conduct one big mela wherein the, the research programs that what ISRO needs is being tabulated. Uh, uh, catalog and is put in the website and uh, the, the different uh, institutes we all get together and discuss and then uh, some specific programs are selected and that we are continuously we are we are we are uh, i mean the, the funding also is done by isro for that the respond program that is one thing second thing is we have something called uh, space technology cells in uh, various institutes like IIT, all the IITs, IIT Mumbai, IIT Chennai, IIT Karakpur, IIT Kanpur, wherein again, uh, there is a combined effort by one uh, PI from the uh, institute and another co-PI from our ISRO, and the specific uh, topics are discussed, decided, and then again, the funding is done by ISRO for them to develop the uh, particular uh, product which is required by ISRO again. So this is another uh, mechanism uh, this mechanism can be extended to uh, UPES also. I don't find any problem. Only thing is you need to conduct a capacity building program office, CBPO, office and headquarters. Uh, you contact them and uh, they will guide you. There are methods by which you can, you can initiate a discussion and then decide how and converge how to go ahead on this. It, it, it is definitely entertained. It is definitely encouraged in this world. Uh, sorry, sir. This, uh, just now we have uh, Professor Sunil Rai, who is the Vice Chancellor of UPES. He just had joined. So, sir, uh, could you just uh, say a few words? We, we just have completed the talk and we are in the discussion of question and answer session. Sir, please unmute. Good evening. and. Uh... I pay my respect and greetings to the director sir and for kindly consenting to uh, uh, you know address us for this particular event. Uh, thank you very much sir. It's my apologies I was into certain induction processes now that the students are joining. Uh, so uh, it's it's a day long process that we are going on and which is why I could not join earlier than what I had thought. Uh, at at uh, Sir. Thank you, sir. It is, it's a pleasure and it's a privilege to meet you. Of course, we would be delighted if you can, of course, uh, pay a visit to us on the campus. Uh, we would definitely look for so the students actually gain a lot from such interactions. And at aerospace uh, engineering, we are uh, the, that department uh, where Sudhir comes from is doing extremely well. And uh, though not large in numbers, but definitely large in efforts. And we are uh, always getting the patronage of uh, ISRO. And ISRO, I had been having some good uh, connections uh, before Shiv Kumar ji also. And uh, we, they, I was the vice chancellor of Kaziranga University. And okay. uh, so there, so Shiv Kumar ji, we had actually, we had the privilege of uh, conferring honorary doctorate on him. And uh, we would be very keen to continue to keep getting guidance of ISRO and we would like to do on certain guided projects. It's our wish that we can, under your uh, guidance and mentorship, contribute and help the region. Uh, we are, I'm sure that uh, ISRO must be having these kind of arrangements, maybe with the uh, other institutions 
but uh, we are very keen to make a contribution and particularly in trying to help the state in sign kind of early warnings and actually analyzing the patterns. Uh, the one thing that concerns me, sir, and uh, where we would of course like to work and seek your guidance is that it's really a pity that the the state is going through such problems uh, where I think it needs to. Uh, one is the safety of uh, the people of the state, particularly in the Chamoli region where the mountains are actually these are mud mountains and because of heavy rains, uh, many a times we keep losing a lot of lives. So there can be some kind of a tracking early warning system and maybe we can work on that project and help the government to issue these kind of early warnings so that uh, particularly the remote villages of Chamoli where we have this flurry of uh, rains, we can sort of, uh, you know, help them. And the other one is we are also very keen to work and study these climatic patterns here and also uh, make our own research and contributions. Uh, it's it's a pity that the last year we had a, a situation where the glacier melted in the month of January. Uh, glacier melting in the month of January is a pity for the mankind uh, in, in Uttarakhand. And as a result, we lost uh, one power station and more than 500 lives as per, was reported uh, because the, 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 the there was hardly any uh, warning that was given and the entire uh, this was a very different kind of a plant as you would uh, recollect sir hydro power plant but it was kind of an in situ where the river would flow into the plant unlike the other places where they take a diversion so the entire load was taken by the plant and the complete plant was there was no chance for people to uh, escape so maybe on such projects we can work under your guidance and uh, so this was a wish that I thought I will submit to you. And uh, uh, thank you very much for your uh, time, sir, and patronizing us. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, first of all, as I said, it's a privilege to meet you. Uh, probably, definitely, at some point, of, some point of time, I'll try to make a visit there, depending on your uh, convenience also. Uh, it's, it's always a pleasure and uh, it's uh, always uh, uh, I, I find it uh, invigorating to discuss with students face to face rather than in a virtual mode. That is one thing. The other points that you have addressed, especially with respect to Himan, the Uttarakhand state, is very, very uh, valid, sir. Uh, uh, let me tell you that, especially regarding the flash, the glacier uh, uh, event or incident that has happened, you may be already aware our Indian Institute of Remote Sensing in Dharadun itself, they are doing a quite good job there. And uh, as I understand, at that time, uh, they, they only pinpointed the, the final uh, uh, the root cause uh, with, the, with, the, with the images that we could provide that a big chunk of uh, the, 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 the glacier itself uh, disappeared in just one, one, in less than a minute, minute of uh, time. So uh, these kind of scenario, I think they are, they are already doing a very detailed analysis and uh, on this. Uh, but as you rightly said, uh, I, I was explaining to another question from a student wherein we have some mechanism wherein uh, we can have research collaborations. So I have already indicated them to talk to the capacity building program office. The details are very easily available in the website. But apart from that, having IARS, which is a neighbor to you, I think uh, by contacting, I will also talk to director IARS so that uh, you can have some interactions with the IARS also. And definitely, I'm seeing a good possibility wherein uh, the, a joint work can be taken up. Because uh, whatever you are talking, it is in the realms of uh, what IAR is doing. So that will be really uh, a good combination. Uh, so I think definitely we should take this up. I will also talk to IAR director on this, and uh, we will see whether something can be initiated on that. Thank you very much, sir. Actually, what happens is where if, if there is some efforts that are required, we would definitely like to work with them. Uh, somehow, uh, ISRO keeps on guiding me and supporting me. Uh, when I was at Kaziranga University, when we met Shiv Kumar Ji, right. uh, that time also we have a facility of ISRO in Guwahati. Yes, but sir. for some reasons, uh, uh, we did not find uh, that we are able to use that particularly that there the problem was the, the Brahmaputra, which is a wild river. 
changing its course and uh, when it becomes wild, it almost takes few villages uh, in that uh, zippy. So there also I had submitted and of course Kumarji was guiding us that see basically one is to get the data and other is to work with the data and take some uh, actions and then support the government. So I'm working with uh, particularly the state government. You would be pleased to know, sir, that we are now uh, working with the state government to solve that problem of reverse migration because people from the hills actually leave to other places for want of economic needs. Uh, so here we are actually trying to work with the state on homestays project so that the livelihood can be coming here. And uh, if we have to actually get uh, the tourism uh, larger than what it happens now, I think we have hardly tapped about 5% of the potential. Now it is when such kind of uh, early warning guidance systems, etc. may also be helped. So if there is some uh, build up required on the efforts of uh, Rurki. Rurki keeps on helping us in any case, sir. We use the lab facilities because they have one of the finest facilities in this region. Uh, we also have certain other institutions. So definitely, sir, we will look forward to you connecting us to them and we would like to uh, make our efforts in that direction. Right. Definitely, sir. We will try. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. So we can have one last question for the day. So it's a very unique question. How it feels to work for the most premium space agency? Can you repeat? I'm sorry. I could not get it clearly. Okay. Ayush has asked how it feels to work for the most premium space agency. Yeah, definitely. I, I love to talk about this because let me tell you that uh, first of all, I'm extremely proud. Uh, that I am part of ISRO. No questions about it. See, ISRO is very special uh, in in one sense because uh, I may, maybe some of you would have heard about ISRO culture. What we talk about. So, what is this ISRO culture that some people are talking about? Is some of the attributes which have been inculcated from the years by our forefathers and the founding fathers and the visionaries that we had. ISRO was very lucky to have a very series of uh, wonderful leaders, wonderful uh, visionaries uh, uh, continuously. So the initial uh, vision or the initial char characterization or the kind of uh, conceptualization of how ISRO should work, which was conceived by people like Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, and Professor Satish Dhawan has been continued by the next the, the, the subsequent leaders, uh, including the present uh, our, our present chairman Sri So uh, that is the uh, that is a fundamental point that the continuity has been maintained. And the most important attribute I would say with respect to what we what is happening here, one is I must say absolute transparency. Here everybody is allowed to talk technical and I'm, I'm talking with respect to technical things whenever a discussion is happening anybody even if it is chairman who is chairing the meeting the the lowermost uh, uh, engineer grade the, the person can stand up and talk and say what he wants or what is his opinion and uh, what is his technical judgment or assessment he is free to talk he's allowed to talk he's encouraged to talk so that is one absolute transparent as far as discussions are concerned. But at the same time, once the debates are our debates are extremely uh, uh, noisy, extremely hot, people will think you now two people are going to hit each other, that kind of scenario will be there. But once the discussions are over, everything is back to normal. And also, the uh, once a decision is taken, then everybody is collectively responsible for implementing that decision, whether you like it or not. And that is the second point, discipline. So transparency, discipline. These are all the things you for the closure. entire community of ISRO is working on passion. Everybody is passionate about their work. They are they, even whatever job they are doing, be it administration or be it any other thing, or up to what chairman is doing, they are absolutely passionate and committed. So passion and Vitro people are not working for the salary alone. Let me put it very clearly. So 
the, the commitment, the passion that is inculcated continuously. That is that is a uh, another attribute, I would say. And another, uh, and again, along with the commission, uh, the passion and commitment, another important thing is absolute uh, integrity. I think that is the most important thing you students also should learn. This is the part, especially missions like space. You as individual cannot achieve anything. It is always collective effort. A group effort only will succeed. There is no individual effort. No individual can achieve anything in his own, on his own. It is always a collective effort. And if collective effort has to succeed, integrity is paramount. So that is another culture that has got inculcated to all of us. Um, again, when I say passion, why I am saying passion is I have personally, if you ask me, I have been associated with more than 50 launches now, 50 minutes of ISRO. And whenever I'm sitting in Sri at the time of countdown, when the countdown says minus 10, minus 9, minus 8, immediately you feel a pang and you are you start you start shaking. Because any space mission, however confident you are, always probability is 50-50. That is the beauty of space missions. So that that uh, that tension and that kind of concern will always be there. And once the vehicle lifts off majestically at T0 from the launch pad, definitely on every person, the eyes, there will be tears. Even though we are we are absolutely uh, used to this, some of the PSLE launches, etc., are very routine now, still that feeling rules us. So the passion controls us, commitment controls us, integrity controls us. So this is put together the uh, so-called ISRO culture, what we call it. And that is what is, makes ISRO very unique. I hope to God that this continues for continuously as long as ISRO is there, this should continue. And that is the success mantra of ISRO. And I'm extremely, extremely proud of it. I hope I conveyed my feelings. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your kind time. I think we are running uh, short of time. And uh, thank you so much for joining us and uh, delivered such a wonderful lecture on Mission Gaganyan. And uh, mm, thank you, VC sir, for uh, you know last minute joining uh, since he was very much busy in induction program. Thank you, Sarvesh ji, for organizing such a wonderful session. And thanks to all the audiences. Thanks to Director HSFC Office for organizing, maintaining, and you know executing the operation so well. And uh, thank you so much, sir. And we are looking to looking forward to have you on campus one day. Thanks so much, sir. Jai Hind. Jai Bharat. Okay, all the best. Take care. Thank, so. thank you. Thank you, thank sir. You. Jai Hind. Thank you, Mohit, for the backend support. Thank you, everyone.